If life has constrained you to a particular kind of pathway that God has not ordained for you, God is saying in 2021, He will restore your fortune. Whenever there is restoration, is always accompanied by divine intervention and divine visitation. If you are going to overcome the Jacob factor in your life, learn from Jacob, please. There must be no room for anxiety and agitation. You must know him whom you have believed. Hallelujah. I trust your week has been going well. Uh, the Lord will perfect all that has to do with each and every one of you in Jesus' name. And to our online viewers, thank God for your lives. Thank you for keeping faith with us. We trust that God's word will meet you at the point of your need in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow. Restoration. We've been looking at the dimensions of the restoration. And we took a break last Sunday to celebrate friendship in our Friendship Sunday. And um, today, by the grace of God, we'll be continuing our series on divine intervention and visitation. We did say that one of the things that accompanied the restoration of our fortunes is divine intervention and divine visitation. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Before we continue, I would like us to do a quick housekeeping on last Sunday's message. Amen. Perhaps I will leave that till the end of the service. And if I may kill you, you will recall that in looking at divine intervention and visitation, we began to trace the children of Israel from the beginning and the things that befell them, how God 
started with Abraham and intervened in his life and restored his fortune after almost 25 years of promise to him. We saw how after that promise in Genesis 15, he bungled it and um, under pressure from Mama Sarai and Ishmael showed up in the lineage of Abraham. And we saw how somehow, despite the fact that they believed, it was credited to him for righteousness in Genesis 15, there was no confirmation of Abraham's faith until it was tested in Genesis 22. Hallelujah. And of course, after he passed the test, we saw the children of Israel go into Egypt after many years. And in Egypt, we saw the great exploits that Joseph did. Hallelujah. I would like us to quickly go to Exodus chapter 1. We try to trace from Genesis 15 all the way to Genesis 49 and 50. When Jacob passed on, and after Jacob passed, we remember that Joseph also passed. And after Joseph passed, of course, the game began to change after many years. We are tracing divine intervention and visitation in the lives and affairs of his people. Exodus chapter 1. Let's quickly read from verse 1. So, so far we've seen how they came to Egypt. He brought his father Jacob to Egypt. His father was surprised that so these guys was, have scorned me. They told me Joseph was dead, but here was Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt. And then all that happened. But let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all those who were descendants of Jacob, there were 70 persons, for Jacob. Joseph was in Egypt already. Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful, and they increased abundantly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and they are mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Self-preservation. They needed to preserve their, themselves. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their bodies and they build for Pharaoh supply cities. Pitham and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and they grew. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They made their lives better with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service in which they made them serve with rigor. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. So that opened something up. And I did say that after he tried suffering, and he saw that the more he suffered the people of God, the more they grew, the more they multiplied. They became strengthened in their hand. They became highly skilled in the things that they were doing. Hallelujah. He decided to try another thing. That you know what? If affliction is not working, what can we do? We must check these guys unless or else they overrun us. So what should we do? In Exodus chapter 2, we saw him develop a bath, the first bath control mechanism. He called the Hebrew women and charged them, make sure you kill all the males if you see them and um, let no one escape. 
If they are ladies, leave them alone. But somehow, by divine intervention, Moses escaped death. And he began to live in Pharaoh's place, palace, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That was by divine intervention. He escaped. He escaped the law that the king Pharaoh set over the entire land. Why? Because God was going to restore the fortune of his people and whenever there's going to be a restoration of fortune, divine intervention comes into play. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay, let's quickly fast track this stuff. Well, you and I know what happened to Moses. He grew up in Pharaoh's palace as Pharaoh's son, as an heir to the throne of Pharaoh. And suddenly when he became of old, of age, about 40 years of age, it came into his heart. Something came into his heart. The force of destiny came into his heart. He knew somehow that perhaps God has raised me as a deliverer for my people. And what did he do? He saw an Egyptian and an Hebrew boy having a quarrel. And that instinct of a deliverer came upon him and he killed the Egyptian. Glory to God. Well, he thought nobody knew. And we're told that by the next day, he now saw two Hebrew boys, his own kith and kin, quarreling among themselves. And of course, the judge instinct, the leadership instinct in him came into operation and he tried to separate them. Brethren, why are you fighting? You are brothers. But what did they do? The guys flee and say, please, go away from us. You want to kill us like you killed Egyptian yesterday? Hallelujah. There is nothing that is hidden under the sun. Whatever it is you do, it may not be revealed. I want you to know that it's not covered. There's nothing that is hidden under the sun. Hallelujah. So this boy said, you want to kill us like you? He thought nobody knew about what happened the previous day. Hallelujah. Let's quickly fast track. He went on self-exile. Exodus chapter 2. Let's read from verse 16. While in exile, he married his benefactor, the priest of Midian's daughter. Exodus 2. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water. They filled the troughs to water their father's flock. You see that again? Did you see that again? Daughters. Daughters stepping into the shoes. Taking responsibility. The man had seven daughters. And these daughters were shepherds. Shepherdess. Like we saw of Mama Rebecca. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. I don't know where it is gotten that women must be housewives. That they are created not to do anything but to be subservient. We've seen industrious women like Mama Rebecca. The elder brothers were there but she was the one that shepherded the sheep into the flock to water them and to care for them. Here we see the daughters of Midian. Hallelujah. The prophet of me, the priest of Midian. Then the shepherds came, drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and he watered their flock. You see that instinct again. How do you know your calling and your gifts? Somehow at every stage of your life, these things begin to manifest. Saw so these ladies wanting to be cheated and the instinct in him, the leadership instinct in him rose up again. He helped them and he watered their flock. Verse 18. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. Why did they call Moses an Egyptian? Why was he called an Egyptian? It's Luke. It looks, his look may have been like them. He has grown up in the, mouth, in the household of Pharaoh since he was born. His speech will have resembled them. 
It's diction. If they had accent, when an Igbo man speaks English, you know he's an Igbo man. Hallelujah. When a Yoruba man speaks English, you know he's a Yoruba man. Can I have an amen? When a Yoruba man, when an Hausa man who was born in Yoruba land speaks, you will never know he's an Hausa man. Hello? Are you there? Environment. The gene is the same. The other day they were showing the chief of the, of the, of the Muslims in Oyo State. And if you saw the diction of this guy, when he was speaking, I was saying, is this the one or somebody else? He said he was born and grew up in Abelkuta. What are we saying? Environment conditions your speech, conditions your life. It doesn't matter how the seed is. It doesn't matter the quality of the seed. The environment will shape and condition that seed to itself. Moses was known by strangers as an Egyptian. They saw him, they heard him, they interacted with him, and they said, an Egyptian saved us. Be careful who you mix with, who you mingle with. Environment matters. Hallelujah. Environment is important. You can't lie down with dogs and not get up with feces. Show me your friends and I will show you who you are. Hallelujah. They called Moses an Egyptian. Delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. He also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Then Moses was content to live with the man and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. What a way of reward. A laboring man is worthy of his wages. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You will not labor in vain in 2021. In 2021, you will not labor in vain. I say you will not labor in vain. In the name of Jesus. Your labor will bring forth fruits. And you will partake of the fruits of your labor. In the name of Jesus. Was rewarded handsomely. Verse 22. She bore him a son. He called his name Geshem. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time. Time is one of the greatest umpires of destiny. Whatever it is God is saying to you, just be steady, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And you see how the process of time will reveal the word of the Lord in your life. And that's why we can't afford to give up. We are not of those that draw back unto perdition, but those that believe unto the saving of the soul. You must know whom you have believed and hold on to him. It happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out. Hallelujah. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Name dropping is allowed in friendship. Hallelujah. He remembered his covenant with his friend. These are the children of my friend Abraham. He heard their groanings. He remembered his covenant. Verse 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. In 2021, the Lord will acknowledge your groanings. He will acknowledge your pains. He will acknowledge your shame. He will acknowledge your sorrow. And it will come true for you. He will divinely intervene in your situation. He will visit you in the name of Jesus. 
God acknowledged them, acknowledged their groanings. And the process of time is God's ears too short, too deaf that he can't hear you know. Are his hands too short that he cannot save you know. But there is something called the fullness of time. The process of time. Hallelujah. He acknowledged them. Let's go to chapter 3. We finish chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 3. Now Moses was tending. Hallelujah. So we see the closing of one chapter. Something was taking place in Egypt. The people were groaning. Hallelujah. Here was Moses. He's been in exile for how many years? Close to 40 years. He lived 40 years in the, uh, the palace of Pharaoh and another 40 years in the wilderness. He needed the 40 years to learn all that he has learned over the 40 years. In the wilderness. And what happened as the people were groaning when the fullness of time came and Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Hallelujah. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. When it is your fullness of time to manifest, God will do everything to get your attention. Hallelujah. Even if he has to turn his angel into a burning bush just to attract your attention, he will do so. By this time, Moses was submissive to God. He went ahead of his time 40 years ago. Now he has learned his lesson. No matter how zeal is pushing you, you better don't push yourself. Hallelujah. You may be zealous. You want to serve the Lord. You want to do this. You want to do this. Wait for his time. He that believes shall not make haste. Wait for his time. The process of time. The fullness of his time. Hallelujah. So when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, who was the one directing all of these affairs? He is right there in heaven and he's looking at the earth and he saw his people. And okay, it's now my fullness of time. He saw them groaning. He acknowledged them. And what did he do? And he saw Moses at the other side in exile. Hey boy, how you doing? Hope you have learned your lessons. Say, Father, Father, Baba God, I have learned. Okay, that's cool. Now you are ready for the assignment. And then he orchestrated the burning bush to get his attention. Prophetic synchronization. Can I have an amen? He rules and reigns in the affairs of men. He knows how to touch a man to leave California, USA. To head to Nigeria just to come and meet you because he's the one he has appointed for you. Can I have an amen? He knows how he can send a man from South Africa who has lived all his life in South Africa for 10, 15 years. But now it is time for the fullness of time because he's the one that God has ordained to be your husband. He knows how to move his heart to begin to come home and probably relocate home. It's God that is at work. And then we orchestrate it one thing or the other. Oh yes, you have to go to Abuja. Oh yes, to go and process your visa. To go and meet the South African embassy. And right there as he's doing that, he's orchestrating your divine meeting. Can I have an amen? amen. 
You must acknowledge the almightiness of God. He rules and reigns in the affairs of men and the affairs of nations. When his fullness of time has come, there is nothing the devil can do to stop him. And in your life, there is nothing. God will intervene and the Lord will visit you. In the name of Jesus. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then God said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Hallelujah. We are standing. Name on holy ground. Listen, friends. Well, if you are going to walk with God and experience His divine providence and divine orchestration, you must live a holy life. You cannot be living a careless life, jumping from one boyfriend to the other, from one boyfriend to the other, and you think there will be the prophetic synchronization. No! Hallelujah. Because it's easy for you to believe. Oh yes, pastor said it. Oh, we have seen it. No, you must maintain your holiness. Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If you're going to see God manifest in your life and your situations, you must live a life of holiness. You must maintain a holy life. Off your shoes. For the ground you are standing is holy. If it wasn't, if he was not standing on holy ground, the prophet will not synchronize. Because God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. You cannot be operating in sin and you think God will acknowledge you. You think God will see you. You think he will hear your groanings. No! Hallelujah. So you are standing on holy ground. Holy ground, holy, holiness creates the ground for the divine hand of God to move in our lives and in our situations. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Look at the humility. He hid his face. God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. Moses hid his face. He was afraid to behold the holy God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and I have heard their cries because of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and a large land to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Hallelujah. This year, the Lord will intervene in your situation. I said, the Lord will intervene in your situation. I have come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, verse 9, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Not only is God seeing your cries, your tauntings, your mockings, and your affliction, he's also looking at what the enemies are doing to you. Hallelujah. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh. That you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
This is your year of divine intervention. I said 2021 is your year of divine intervention. I don't know under whose mighty hand you have been oppressed, battered, afflicted, in pains and in sorrow. But 2021 is your year of divine intervention. God will divinely intervene. He will divinely visit you. In the name of Jesus, you will experience his mighty hand this year. In the name of Jesus. Look at what he did for Israel. Look at how he lined up the events one after the other. When you think of the almighty God has been there and is looking at the entire world, that shouldn't be too difficult to explain to you these days. Shouldn't. Amen? You all have your Google Maps. From where you are, you are going to Lagos. And you, pull, you punch the address. What happens? The thing zooms. Zooms to the globe of Lagos and then you begin to zoom on the address. Who gave them the technology? Hallelujah. So that's what happens. Google knows, the ad he knows your address. He knows the address of everybody here. As long as you have a phone with you, can I have an amen? They will just check out your IP. Every device that is connected to their server, they know where it's from. That's why some sites will block you. You cannot, there are some sites that I shop from in the US. Once I try to access it from here, it's forbidden. Because they say, no emails from Nigeria. Hallelujah. So every one of you carrying a smartphone, Google knows you. He knows where you are right now. Some of you are even using location services, isn't it? And when you open it, you see the dots beeping where you are. If they want to send a bomb to you straight, they'll just press to this address. Hallelujah. How much more God? You think he doesn't know your address? If Google can, do you think he doesn't know your address? Google does not know how you feel, but God knows how you feel. He knows your emotions. He knows the pains you are going through. He knows your afflictions. He knows the mockings and the tauntings. He does. And he's your father. You think he doesn't care about you? He does. He made you in his image. Hallelujah. The Lord will arrange events and circumstances. And they will line up for the restoration of your fortunes. In 2021, events, situations, and circumstances, they will line up for the restoration of your fortunes. In the name of Jesus. I don't care how many years you may have lost in search for your solution to that challenge. But in 2021, every situation and circumstances will line up to cost your restoration of your fortunes in the name of Jesus. You better believe it. Glory to God. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, give me verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding. Neither is favor to men of skill. But time and chance happens to them all. Hallelujah. Give it to me in the New Living Translation. I have observed something else under the sun. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. The skillful are not necessarily wealthy. Those who are educated always don't lead successful lives. It's not a guarantee. Education is not a guarantee for you to live a successful life. 
It is all decided by God, not chance. Hallelujah. It is all decided by God by being in the right place at the right time. In 2021, the Lord will order your steps. You will be at the right place at the right time. I said you will be at the right place at the right time. In the name of Jesus, you will be divinely positioned in time. You are at the right place at the right time. Success comes. It's decided by God, not chance. It's decided by God. Who orders our steps? The steps of the righteous, they are ordered by the Lord. Hallelujah. So we saw how God restored the fortunes of his people. What began in Genesis chapter 15, 400, and 400 years, he said, There will be slaves in Egypt. But after 400 years, I will restore their fortunes. And I've said this to you before I repeat it again. There was nothing they could have done if that time was not complete. Was there? They can pray and fast and, and roll on the ground and somersault, begin to walk on their head and do all manners of gymnastics. Nothing will have happened until the fullness of time. Hallelujah. May you be in the center of the will of God. May you be in the center of his will for your life. He says, the psalmist says in Psalm 31 verse 15, our times are in his hands. Learn to live your life with this knowledge and understanding. You will walk in peace and the lines will fall unto you in pleasant places. In the name of Jesus. So God restored their fortunes and they were delivered out of Egypt into the wilderness. They crossed the Red Sea, divine intervention. And when they got to the other side of the Red Sea, what happened? They began to share the land and Moses didn't get to the promised land. Joshua took over the baton and then what happened? Joshua shared all the land according to their tribes, according to what God has spoken to Moses. He shared it. He had no new mandate. He was following the mandate and the template God had given to Moses because his ministry was a continuum to follow the agenda of God. And after he has shared the land, we are told that all the while in the time of Joshua, the land had peace and the people were living in obedience. But after Joshua died and all of that generation with him, what happened? We learned the people began to do as they liked. Go with me to Joshua chapter 21. They began to misbehave. They went on the frolic of their own. Joshua 21 verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We saw that earlier also in Joshua, in Judges, please. Judges, pardon me. Judges 21, 25. From Judges 17, 6, the same thing was said. In those days, Israel had no king and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So what happened? They began to go on a frolic of their own. They began to do as it pleased them. They began to do whatever it was they liked. Hallelujah. And as the sun was setting on the reign of Joshua, God began to prepare another face for his people. Hallelujah. Go with me to First Samuel. First Samuel is after Judges. That's what led to the coming of Samuel the prophet. Hallelujah. Whenever God wants to restore the fortune of his people, he visits them. 
there is divine intervention. Please don't forget. That is the point we are emphasizing. There will be a divine intervention. There will be a divine visitation. Hallelujah. Ruth is in between. I told you that. It's between Judges and Samuel. But that is just a detour. That's to connect some of the dots. But after Judges, Ruth, then you have 1 Samuel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The book of 1 Samuel describes the transition of leadership in Israel from Judges to Kings. Three characters are prominent in the book. Samuel, the last judge, and the first prophet. He was transitioner. He was a judge, and at the same time, a prophet. Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, the king elect, anointed, but not yet recognized as Saul's successor. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you look at the book of Judges and the book of 1 Samuel, as Samuel was coming on the scene, there were three major things that took place. One, there was spiritual ineptitude among the Levites. You can see that in Judges 21, there was spiritual ineptitude among the Levites. And it's the parallel you see in 1 Samuel is in the dullness of Eli and his corrupt sons. And how they conducted the affairs of the temple at Shiloh. Number two, the second thing that was prevalent in the time. There was sexual misconduct in Shiloh, in the temple. There was sexual misconduct. In Judges 21 from verse 15 to 25. You see that parallel and you can compare that with the what Ophnes and Phinehas did to those who are serving in the temple. Sexual misconduct. And thirdly, there was a Levitical involvement in tragic military encounters in Judges 19 and verse chapter 20. Hallelujah. In other words, needless wars that they went into. I do not have enough time because that's not my emphasis to show you how this parallel are playing out in our country today. Spiritual ineptitude in the church of the living God. The prophets have become dull of hearing. We hear of prophets who get babalawo powers just to remain relevant. Spiritual ineptitude. Sexual misconducts in the temple at Shiloh. This is prevalent. And of course, needless wars. Between minister and minister, pastors and pastors, ministries and ministries. Among believers, a thing that ought not to be. Eventually, those kind of needless wars took the life of Phinehas and his brother Hophni on the same day in 1 Samuel chapter 4. This was a transition between what happened in Judges and in Samuel, reflected by the carryover of those prophets. Hallelujah. But friends, when God heard the groanings of his people, he began to prepare. And that's what I want to just highlight to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. First Samuel chapter 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim. So we see that God wanted to now restore the fortunes of his people. And none of those of the old order was qualified. Remember what he did in the time of Moses. He waited for him. He supernaturally preserved him such that he was saved when the king had said, kill all the men, all the boys. Here, God waited and looked for a woman who was still sane. And then what did he do? He preserved her womb and closed her womb. That no, until I'm ready, I will not open your womb. Hallelujah. Look at her jealous wife syndrome. Penina, Hallelujah. She was just giving birth like, hmm? tell me, like every year. P, 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 P. Hallelujah. But what happened to Hannah? Hannah was taunted. Verse 6, 1 Samuel 1, 6. Her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. 
Sometimes the things you are going through is orchestrated by the Lord. It's orchestrated by the Lord. Men can mock you. Men can taunt you. They can make your life miserable, but it's only for a time, for as long as God will permit them. Can I have an amen? And that's why I'm confident that whatever it is you are going through, for as long as you are walking in line with the will of God, for as long as you have dedicated yourself and said, Lord, let only your will be done in my life. As long as you are walking in the, in the center of his perfect will for your lives, it doesn't matter how miserable men may make you feel. It's just for a time. It's just for a time. Year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Year by year, at least more than two years. Always weeping. When they go to Shiloh to rejoice, to offer sacrifices to the Lord, she was always weeping. Year after year, you do your convention. At my convention, people are giving testimonies. Praise the Lord. By this time last year, I did not have a baby. But thank God, here it is. I hear you are locking yourself up in a corner crying. Year by year. Life is being made miserable. By situation and circumstances that you have no control over. Her husband couldn't comfort her. Why are you not weeping? Why are you not eating? Kule, yeah. <laughs> You're asking me why I'm not eating. Is it food that is my problem? All the one I've been eating all these years, has it produced? Say, why are you not eating? Why do you weep? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. But what happened? The Lord visited Hannah. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle. Amen. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And what happened? Then she made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservants and remember me and not forget your maidservants, but we give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord. Oh, how many days of his life? And no razor shall come upon his head. Hallelujah. God was waiting for her to get to that state of mind. If God had given her the son before now, what kind of a child do you think Samuel will be? Spoiled brats. In fact, all the miserableness that Penina and the children suffered her, she will make sure that ten times is meted on Penina. True or false? In fact, she will say, you know what? Before I bring my child into the house, I want you to evacuate that woman. I don't want to see her again. Or go and build my own mansion for me. And then they will give the boy a Lexus or Bentley. Maybe he will die before his time. Can I have an amen? amen. Hallelujah. God needed to get her to that state. God needed somebody that will be the deliverer of his people and is just waiting for you to come to terms. He's waiting for you to come and begin to operate on his level, on the same frequency with him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. As the Lord visited Hannah and intervened in a situation, in the midst of the taunts and the mockings of Penina and her children, and gave us somewhere. So the Lord will visit you. I said, so the Lord will visit you. In the name of Jesus. The Lord that has kept you this far and strengthened you, such that you did not give up. In 2021, you will not give up before he shows up. I said, you will not give up before God shows up. In the name of Jesus. Who never thought that Eli, corrupt priest, will be the one God we use? He was corrupt. 
en essence. Alléluia. The old prophet, he wasn't hearing God anymore. I'm sure you know, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it was a young boy, two years old, that God began to speak to. This man has become dull of hearing. Corruption has blindfolded him. Corruption has blocked his ears. He wasn't hearing God anymore. But you know something? Hannah was at the right place at the right time. God positioned his prophet to be right there while she had made up her mind and made a vow to the Lord. And God used his prophet to affirm her vows. Can I have an amen? Listen to me. The Lord will divinely visit you. Amen. Even by the hands of the unexpected. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Who would have thought that God will still be able to use a lie? And that's why your eyes must be sharp. Your eyes must be open. Your ears must be unstopped. Because God will use unusual people to visit you. Amen. And may you not despise them when you see them. I say, may you not despise them when you see them. In the name of Jesus. All the tongues and the mockings of Penina and her children, they were for the birth of Samuel. But really, were they for the birth of Samuel? It was for a bigger purpose. For the deliverance of Israel. Sometimes the things you are going through, you think it's about you. It's not about you. The pains you are having to endure, it's not just about you. Hallelujah. The afflictions and the groanings and the taunts is not just about you. Your neighbors are taunting you. Your in-laws are taunting you. They are making your life miserable. Oh yes. The peninas of this world, they are making your life miserable. It is for the birthing of a purpose that is much bigger than you. Don't just be fixated about me. I, me and myself. Hannah needed to get to that point. So if you give me this child, it's not about me. I will dedicate him back to you all his life. It's for a bigger purpose. And that's why you must allow the purpose of God to consume you. It's not about you. If you have the child, yes, you are, you are just, is it just to show off? Is it just to say that, yes, I am not barren? Is it just to be counted as a mother? Is that what you are, you are struggling for? Are there people who are not married, who are married, who don't have children, are not living? Can I have an amen? Kamala Harris, I'm just illustrating. I'm not endorsing or not, not endorsing or disendorsing, if there's anything like that. She ain't got no child of her own. She's vice president, first black vice president of the most powerful country in the world. So it's not just the child. Oh, I just want to have a child. Will that put food on your table? It's about the purposes of God. It's about the purposes of God. You may be going through those pains, those mockings, and those tauntings for a bigger purpose than yourself. And you must live in that consciousness. Don't just be fixated about I, me, and myself. What I can just grab. Me, my dog, my children, my in-law, my brother. No! But if only you can endure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I perceive that that which God will do in your life as he intervenes in your situations will be beyond you. It will be for your community. It will be for your world. In the name of Jesus. That business that it will birth through you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. You are thinking of just surviving? No, he's thinking of how it will make you a blessing to the entire world. You are just thinking, if I can just have this, if I can just have a house, a roof over my head, that's all, I'm okay. No! God is looking at something bit bigger. How you impact your generation. How you impact your world. Allow God to fill your heart with his purposes. Allow him to fill your heart with his purpose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Shout hallelujah. Whenever there is going to be a restoration of the fortunes of God's people. There will be divine intervention and divine visitation. Shout hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to end 
with one prayer. Please go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. There are many other instances. Zechariah and Elizabeth. When God was going to come and intervene in the world of Jesus' time. He needed a forerunner. And he delayed the womb of Elizabeth. So that he can synchronize it. So that she can give birth to the forerunner. Hallelujah. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. The pains and the afflictions, the mockings and the tortures that Elizabeth and Zechariah went through. Was it just for them to have a child? It was for the birthing of a bigger purpose. Their son, the baby that her womb will carry, will be the forerunner of the savior of the world. Sometimes those pains and afflictions and sorrows that you are going through is to bath a purpose that is bigger than yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why your eyes must be on the ball. What is the ball? Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 15. Therefore I also, and this is a prayer I want you to begin to pray. Put it into your prayer journal and every day verbalize these prayers to yourself before you leave home. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What is the prayer? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in you, his saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Which he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hallelujah. To make it easy for you, verses 17 to 19 is okay for you. Give us a New Living Translation 17 to 19. Hallelujah. Let it be about the purpose of God. The pains and the afflictions you are going through. You want divine intervention? Lord, intervene for your purpose. Don't just lift this burden over me. Just for lifting sake. But let your purpose be bathed. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insights. Revelation. So that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. So that you can understand that your heart will be flooded with light that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. So I also pray that you will be able to understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. Hallelujah. For us who believe in him. If you understand the incredible power of God, the God that is able to see his people groaning in Egypt, and also see Moses, that Moses is now a humble man. He has climbed down from his high horse. He wanted to serve me, but he was going to do so in the flesh. He was not going to wait for me. He thought he knew it all. He has become a master. He has pretended to be the heir apparent of Pharaoh. And now he thinks he has his clout to lead my people. No. It's not by power. It's not by might. But by my spirit, says the Lord. If you believe and understand the incredible greatness of God's power, who believe in him, we need to pray those prayers for ourselves. That we will believe, we will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. Because sometimes what is lacking is we don't know how powerful this our God is. 
Let's rise up on our feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus.